Hi guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Last week's episode, we had presented some data provided by Eric Coles of the Cave Nebula. It was a really brief uh, episode, and I was hoping that you would take the time to download the data. Um, if you hit didn't, if you haven't, uh, the data is, uh, if you're watching on our website, right over here, uh, right down here, it says Eric's data. You could download it. It's in a Google Drive folder. You could download it now, uh, and you'll have it, and you'll be able to work on it kind of alongside this. Uh, as well, uh, Eric did a kind of walkthrough of this data previously um, entitled The Making of, a, of the Cave Nebula Image by Eric Coles. Uh, it's, it was done on our channel. So if you want to find that, you can either uh, search for it on YouTube or just kind of work your way down our channel and you'll find it. Um, probably six, eight months ago, though. Um, but yeah, so you guys have had a week with the data. Uh, we got a few submissions on our website. And uh, one of them, of course, is going to win the image of the week. So I'm going to show that off first. Hopefully, uh, there we go. Uh, this week's image of the week um, w goes to uh, Mark L. I don't know your last name. Uh, but uh, one thing that stood out to me in this image, first of all, you did a great job of it. Uh, the color seemed to be a little bit off, but um, he did get a lot of detail out of it, and it's a lot of noise-free detail. So there's some things he could work on, but there's also some things that he did really well in this. Uh, so you can check it out on the website if you want to see it in full resolution. Uh, but uh, as I was saying, one thing that did stand out to me was that he processed this in GIMP 2.9. Uh, which is a free processing program. Uh, so that, along with Deep Sky Stacker, could be a really good uh, all free way to process your images. Um, of course, you're going to be spending a lot of money on gear, so maybe it's better to uh, spend a little bit of money on your software. But you don't have to. Uh, you can get your feet wet without, I don't know, breaking the bank. Um, and uh, he did say it, so it was, I wasn't pulling that out of my... Uh, out of my butt. Uh, the color seems a bit off, but hey, it's his first time processing pictures from a monochrome, monochrome camera. So yeah, for a first time, that's uh, a pretty darn good job. Um, and it also managed to pull out a lot of that structure in there. So uh, I'll say is a uh, good job. Uh, guys, as always, you can go onto our website, Image of the Week right there, click Image of the Week Submission and submit your images. I do want to show off <clears throat> a few of the other images. I'm going to start at the bottom. Uh, I don't believe this one is Eric's. Oh, no, this one is. Okay, yes. Bill Leonard. Uh, Bill Leonard's version. Lots of uh, structure in there. Uh, very nice job on that one. Um, Nigel. Uh, did um, kind of a Hubble palette here, um, a really nice job. One nice thing about this is, uh, we get to see it side by side with his second try, which I think he did a little bit better of a job here. Uh, there's a really, really interesting structure up in this area, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, that structure. Um, and, uh, there was one more over here, Sean Maloney, uh, and Sean also did a great job, um, uh, just a nice job, uh, pulling out the detail in the image. Uh, I am also going to show off while I'm at it, uh, Eric's original data, and, uh, I'm going to also suggest you guys check it out, uh, search for Eric Cole's Astro Bin and scan down about eight months and you'll find eight months, maybe longer, about a year ago, um, his cave nebula data. And you can see it in full resolution. So you're not looking at it through this screen, which, uh, probably doesn't give you the best idea. And maybe we'll post a link to this in chat if we can. Um, did anyone do the Hubble palette version? Uh, I believe that told Tolga, right. Tolga. Now, did you do Hubble Palette? 
I did I did mix. I did a Hubble palette and then blended the RGB into it and just came out really funky. But I, it was just like a text test kind of thing, you know. So with all the data Eric provided, we have a lot of options with it. Uh, is that the one I did? This is yours. Uh, yeah. Totally. So yeah, the, you, you see, this is this is actually Hubble palette with RGB mixed into it. Uh, I was just trying something different, you know. Yeah. Uh, Adam, why don't you bring up the Hubble palette version? I mean, that's a completely different look than the RGB. All right, bear with me one second. And here, uh, this isn't going to show up well to you guys. I'm going to do this. Uh, here's the Hubble palette version. Um, now, the nice thing about this is you're working with really clean narrowband data, uh, but uh, I, uh, I'll go into this in a little bit, but uh, I chose to process mostly the RGB image because I process a lot of narrowband data, and that's all I can shoot from here. So when I get an opportunity to shoot something from really dark skies in RGB, then I'm going to take that chance. Um, but uh, Eric, I uh, wh why don't you? I'll keep this image up. If you need me to toggle back and forth between images or any pull anything up on my screen, I believe that uh, the microphone is going to be concentrated on my screen. Yes. Um, why don't you uh, tell us a bit about what you did with this image, what you acquired it with? Uh, I, I was going to ask you what difficulties you may have had with it, but I don't think you had any real technical difficulties. But go ahead, speak for a bit about it. Well, I chose this object because I like Hubble Palette and Emission Nebula. Uh, the object was in a good position. I think it ended up crossing the meridian about 85 degrees, and we had some good seeing conditions for, I think, the four or five days that I collected data. And the Hubble palette came all right, but I think that the image that I really enjoyed most was the RGB data. And the standard processing of the RGB came out okay, but when you apply the HA data and lighten up all those red emissions, you really get something that it looks a little more special than just a straight RGB. Uh, it was a fairly easy item to process. The Hubble palette itself was done with tone mapping. I think we've we've covered that a little bit here. Basically, you combine starless images, uh, you balance the histogram, do a little adjustment, and you get kind of the orange to uh, deep purple uh, palette. Now, I saw that someone actually put up one where they just did a combination. And if you start out without balancing that, if you start out without balancing that histogram, you end up with the green item, the green processing image that you showed a little bit earlier which some people prefer. Uh, so in this object, it was a strong emitter. It was fairly strong in uh, both sulfur, oxygen, and hydrogen alpha. Uh, we had good dark nights. It was high in the sky. And the data was just a pleasure to work with. Uh, as I said earlier, when we we're off camera, there really wasn't anything difficult about this data, uh, unlike some of the galaxies that we process, which are a true challenge. So I thought was, this would be good data for people to go out and, and get the experience of, of data from a dark side on, it, on an object that has uh, strong emissions. Awesome. Oh, um, and of course, we got an APOD for it, too. <laughs> uh, of course. Sorry. And actually, that's, the, that's the cool thing is that uh, people really now get the opportunity to see what it takes in the quality of data. Uh, to get an APOD. And, and, and I'm not going to say that uh, everyone that gets an APOD has this quality of data. In fact, they, they tend to give it to uh, sometimes people you wouldn't expect. But when it comes to really pushing the, uh, the, the extremes or really the hobby as far as it goes, uh, Eric's doing it, uh, Eric and Mel, uh, basically with their acquisition uh, and processing are doing it and doing it well. Well, the nice thing about the Hubble palette and narrowband imaging is you don't you don't have to have the darkest skies. I've done all my narrowband imaging 
up to the time we went out to the SRO from my, my back deck that's <laughs> light enough to read a newspaper at midnight in our neighborhood. And you can still do some fine narrow band imaging from a relatively light polluted site. Mm -hmm. So I think that anyone with the a scope of a certain reach could generate this kind of image in narrowband. RGB is going to be more of a challenge, but uh, Adam, you know that, and I know that here. Yep. Yeah, and that'll that'll give me an opportunity to uh, to talk about it. I don't know if anybody in the room has had any opportunities to process this data. Um, if you have, uh, you know, if you just type in chat uh, in the inside room chat, uh, I did, and then I'll give you like a couple minutes to speak about what you did. Uh, if not, then I am going to go on and on. Hey, uh, hang on, hang on there a second, Adam. Could you? Yes. Is Alex? Um, I just wanted to say something. Um, I I just got back from AIC, uh, which was a couple weeks ago, and um, we went through a series of workshops where people would put their data up on the screen and then show us how to work it. Uh, we particularly noted in um, Krill Camp's, I think it was, um, presentation of his processing of Jupiter and in various other shows that the data that they had at the very beginning, before they put on any uh, noise reduction or anything else like that, was generally better than most of us get after a lot of work. Um, and it, it was a common comment coming out of the, the workshops that, boy, if I had data like that, I could work wonders. Well, I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but I sure would rather be starting with some of that data. And that's just would you reemphasize the point that you were making. Uh, I don't think that getting better data requires uh, spending a lot of money on remote um, uh, observing and stuff like that, but it does require a lot of attention. We, we sometimes give it a second trip because it's not, you know, processing is so much more time intensive. But getting the good data in the first place really makes processing easier. So well, I just wanted to emphasize that with yeah, you. Yeah, let me just, if I could just add to the comment, um, for the first couple of years that I did imaging, I did all narrowband imaging. I actually tried a couple of RGBs and it was a, a, a complete failure with gradients everywhere and I gave up real quickly. But narrowband, you can keep pounding away at narrowband imaging, and you can accumulate, especially the HA, and you can get yourself some really fine images on skies that are quite light. So you don't have to be at a dark site to do fine narrowband imaging. And that's probably what a good percentage of the people that are doing imaging are, are stuck with, are light polluted skies, in our case, 20 miles from Chicago. So, if I had the long read scope here, I could probably generate almost the same image here in narrowband that I did at the SRO, but not the RJB image. If, 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 I may, if I may say something about the remote imaging thing, I think, yes, dark skies help, but I think the thing that helps more is how many nights you have in a, in a, dark, in a remote uh, location that's you know, chosen for this type of thing. You know, having 200, 250 nights, hey, listen, if, if you had 250 nights, if I had 250 nights in New Jersey a year, you know what, I'll bull, I'll, I will spend 100, you know, 100, 200, hour, 100 hours on an image, and I'll meet, I'll meet a data that's from a dark site, but it's just the number of days that I think that's a bigger factor than the dark skies. And, and then they're seeing also, don't forget the fact true, that there's got to be steady skies in order to get the teeny weeny stars. Well, we could spend some time arguing about this. Well, I'm not sure we're arguing. I think well, we're all yeah, we're sure what, um, I yeah, we're all agreeing. But, um, let me bring up a, an image. This is taken from my back porch. And this is a Hubble palette image. And I couldn't do any better if I would have taken it from uh, the SRO on top of Bald Mountain outside of Sacramento. All right, so uh, it's funny. We're, we're discussing narrowband now. And uh, Eric, was it the narrowband version of this that, that had won the APOD? No. It was, it was, it was, it the, was RG the other one. Uh, it was the, the, it was the RGB. And, and 
there's no doubt that that is the more interesting looking image. And, and, and that's exactly what I'm kind of going to uh, elaborate on. Let me see. Uh, are they seeing my screen? Yes, they're seeing my screen. But I want to switch over to, I'm going to do full desktop. Just give me one sec. Um, and I'm going to bring up uh, PixInsight. Um, first, let me show off uh, my version of this uh, in Photoshop. And, and I'll kind of talk about what, what I think is one of the complex things about this image. I, I've tried to, to shoot this a few different times um, in narrow band H alpha uh, and usually trying to enhance an RGB image. And um, what always bothered me about the image is the central region here, uh, I just couldn't get much detail there. It seemed like there was detail there. It seemed like there was structure there. But I, I couldn't really see what it was. It, it just made it blurry. And um, what I realized was, uh, or at least in, in my... Uh, astrophotography artistic mind, uh, I realized that there was some foreground dust structure actually blocking that H alpha. So sharpening it didn't make any sense. The only real way to uh, reveal it would be to get to shoot it from sufficiently dark skies and kind of pull it out that way. Um, I had never had that opportunity. Uh, but with Eric's data, I kind of saw that opportunity. And uh, like I said earlier, I shoot lots of narrow bands, so give me the opportunity to shoot really good RGB or, or process really good RGB, and I'm, I'm really happy. So I decided to try and pull out that structure. So I don't know if you can actually see it, um, but there is foreground dark dust structure uh, pretty much blocking the whole nebula here. Um, and within here, there's other little wispy structures that... I think when we shoot narrow band, which probably is the way that most people are shooting this, you're just completely ignoring that. And uh, where I notice a lot of the wispiness in Eric's RGB image, um, it, it doesn't really show up in the narrow band because it's all reflection. Um, the narrow band is basically just showing the, off the emission. It might show up just a touch, but... Um, not, not really enough to stand out in any reasonable amount of time. Uh, so bringing that structure forward uh, was really uh, something I wanted to do, and uh, this gave me the opportunity to do it. Where I struggled, and maybe it's just me being a little bit rusty, was uh, I could not get the H alpha uh, to align to my RGB. Um, now, I only tried it after I had processed it, but for some reason, uh, I need to go back through, align the H alpha to the RGB, and try and get that enhancement that Eric shows off. And I believe uh, in the previous episode, uh, in, in Eric's episode on um, uh, the making of the Cave Nebula image, I think he went into that enhancement. Um, basically, the enhancement is done in, in two ways. Uh, the same way you enhance a Hubble palette image by getting a starless image, and doing a series of high-pass filters, you can do the same thing in the RGB. Once that image is aligned, then your starless image will lay right over the top of the RGB image, and using a series of progressive uh, high-pass filters, you will bring out as much detail as in the H-alpha. And then you use the H-alpha to lighten up all the red, and you end up with the image that I posted. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, you're not far away. You you will get more detail on some of it, probably more on the edges rather than in that's, the amorphous cloud. Yeah, in the middle. And that's probably where it would visually make the biggest impact because I like the way the the middle looks, but um, you know, with really narrow H alpha filters, there's so much stuff up there, and it really comes out. In fact, let me uh, show you. You you see my pics inside screen now, right? Right. Hey, Adam, was that RGB and H alpha or what? No, so that is just RGB. Uh, I'm still working on getting the H alpha into it, and I will probably try. Okay, because you're having trouble aligning. 
because I was having trouble aligning it. And every time I tried, I ended up with the same issue. Okay. Um, just that's, off by a little bit. That's odd. I'm just, I'll have to take a second look at that. And I'm just, you did I'll, it on a nonlinear images? I, I was doing it on nonlinear images, yes. Okay. Although, uh, I might have done it on linear too. I, I don't know. I was trying a bunch of things. Did you try changing the, uh, like, sometimes I'll do, if I have trouble aligning stuff, um, I'll change the contrast on it, do a curve on it, maybe uh, kill out some of the background and, and boost the stars. Sometimes that helps. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really try that. Um, Although you really don't want to do that to something if it's, you want to do that before you calibrate even, right? So... Or no, it's after calibration, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. All the alignment was done after. Uh, first of all, with the RGB, they were aligned to the best of the RGB subs, and then the hydrogen alpha was used as the alignment for the narrow band. And then when it was all done and stretched out, Everything's then I aligned the two together, and that was my final image. And you notice that that some of these images, like the RGB, is cropped a little bit because there wasn't perfect alignment. Um, let's just see, because people are asking, right? It's, By the way, Eric, um, I, well, I, 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 took I aligned them right off the bat, and there was, there was no problem. You know, I, yeah, I had no problem. Something is odd here. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. Oh yeah. wait, now this is, uh, so this is stretched and that one isn't, no, it won't be this quick, right? I can't align a linear image to a nonlinear image, or can I? I wouldn't do that. Why, why would you do that? You're, you're making it work too hard. It, it well, may work, but there's no guarantee that it will yeah. work. Right. Yeah, the okay. reason I would do it is if I don't do it, then I have to <clears throat> bring this, I have to, bring this all the way to nonlinear before I figure out whether it's actually going to align or not. And that was the issue that I had before is after like putting in half an hour, an hour's worth of processing on the H alpha, I couldn't get it to align with that. You know, Adam, the other issue is that Hicks Insight has issues with rotated or reflected images and trying to align them. I'm not sure why, but. Nah, I, I rotated this one at the last minute, so. What if but, you do a linear fit on the on the on the RGB uh, to match the low levels in the uh, in the uh, narrow band, and then see if you if if you can register them that way? Let me see if uh, just just do a dynamic alignment and just pick a couple stars. Hold on. Well, that's a that's an idea there. Or try a different piece of so a different software package too. No, 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 no. Pix Insight works perfectly on this. There's no need. To. You just got to tweak a little bit. It, it's just that Adam already has a stretched image, right? That that's throwing the complication, and and for all we know, star alignment will work fine. You know, it just. Um, I'm going to pull this up because this should really happen seamlessly. Yep, not a problem. There you go. Let's see. All right, I just want to do this real quick because that's what happened last time. It seemed to work, but hold on. Uh, you don't need perfect alignment to do what we just, you can tweak it. Hold on. Okay, there'll be a uh, Yeah, most of my rustiness is finding the tools and picks inside. 216.08.27. Let me go there.
Uh, you want to mute me for Call a second? From <laughs> it's going to take I, me a while to find this window. Here we go. There we go. He's muted. All right. So basically what I'm doing is I'm stretching it um, just so I can see if it is going to align. I don't even care if it looks good. I can undo all this stuff afterwards and then work on it. Um, <coughs> all so how'd, you get, how'd you get the alignment to work, Adam? It it did the same thing last time. It seemed to work, but um, all I did was honestly the same thing as last time, which is star alignment. But what I want to do is I want to make sure that when I combine the images, whichever way I do it, the stars actually do align. Um, yeah, let me do channel combination. It's not really the way I would do it, but I just want to see if they are. I'm just bringing mine up now. I just want to test out your hypothesis here. Okay. Yeah, mine all lined up just fine when I did it. I don't know why you're having that. And it did it fine in this one, it appears. So, looks good. Yeah. So okay. So I will. Uh, I will have a reprocess of this probably for next week. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, that's what I was struggling with, and I can't say I did it any differently than I did it just now. But oh well. Um, but you could see exactly what you were talking about, where you lost that that white dusty stuff when you put yeah. the H alpha in there. Yeah. So that is going to be where. Um, it's going to be kind of a really delicate uh, blending job. Um, so let me think here. Uh, well, if you want to keep that just selected out, I mean, you don't have to put in the, the detail everywhere. Just do a selection. Or, yeah, or, you, could do a, or you could do a continuum map type blend, uh, very similar to how you would blend um, the RGB stars with uh, – uh, narrow band data uh, using that that math method that uh, I've used before for for PixInsight. Mm -hmm. um, it it's similar to like taking a max of the two images. That way you get the max from the blue filter. So you do kind of a continuum continuum map of the blue, and maybe your O3 or something like that, um, and use that somehow in with your. Uh, your HA for the luminance. That way you get that, that blue kind of top level structure coming out. Okay. I understand what you're saying because the blue, I mean, otherwise it's going to be dominated by red and that's probably what happens up here is it just gets dominated by red. But what you want to do is you want to say, give me the maximum. Uh, but if it's blue, give me the maximum of the blue. Is that what it is? Yeah, because you, what you're trying to do is bring out all this reflection nebula, right? Right. So the, the stuff that's sitting on top or, you know, is, is being illuminated by the stars and the, kind of the dusts and stuff in the area. And that's not going to show up any of any of your narrowband data. It's only going to show up in the blue and luminance data, right? <laughs> okay. So if Adam, you I just went through an alignment and it aligned perfectly. The... <clears throat> the, the None or the linear images just snapped right too. I don't know why. I can't exp I can't explain why I was having I don't, trouble. I don't know why. Um but just call it I, I didn't quite hear that. I think you were cutting out, but but either way, so th this is basically working, but you will see right here. Um let me make this bigger. You will see, uh, you don't get what we were talking about, that foreground structure. And as far as I can see, there's absolutely no reflection that's going to show through in the H alpha. So what you do get is you do get uh, this wispiness of dark dust down here. 
Uh, and the reason that's showing up is there's just that much more uh, emission nebula in the the outside uh, range of it. Even through here, you can see some dark nebula snaking through, uh, another wisp of dark nebula snaking through. So the ultimate goal, I guess, uh, for round two that I would have with this image would be to um, get as much of that displayed as noise-free as possible while retaining uh, what you're going to see in here, this uh, this wispiness, this this foreground st stuff. Um, I so, like what you're pointing out on that. I probably should have paid a little more attention to that one. Yeah, and I, I I only I only point that out because I know that's the one thing that I've struggled on, and I know, you know, uh, before the show. Uh, Eric was uh, saying uh, it's such an easy image because it's uh, really good data. And uh, it's really good data, but I think because, um, because it's such good data, it kind of gives you that opportunity to see stuff that you're not going to see in every cave nebula image. In fact, I, I don't, you don't see that wispiness. You don't see that foreground reflection nebula in many cave nebula images. Um, I think I said this before the show as well. Uh, it it kind of reminds me of when uh, the Hubble released the infrared horsehead nebula, and where the horsehead always looked like a black hole in the in the H alpha clouds. Um, in this new rendition, uh, it stood out in the foreground as this wispy black foreground object that was in front of a background of H alpha. It, it was just a brand new way of looking at it. And I think that because of the quality of this data, it gave me the opportunity to look at the cave nebula differently in a way that I've always actually, the way that I feel like I always have seen it, but I've never been able to bring it out in an attractive way. Um, so yeah, I, I really enjoyed processing this. And actually now that that worked for me, why does it work for me when I'm on on the on live? Uh, when I'm not live, it, usually it goes the other way around, right? It never works for you when you're doing it live. This time it worked for me. Um, but either way, there's a few things I would like to tweak with this image. Um, I'd like to remove a little bit of the larger scale noise that kind of showed up in here. But I think the H alpha blending might do some of that. Um, and yeah, that just that outside, get a little bit more color in there. Uh, possibly remove some of the pink in the nebula and replace it with uh, just a little bit more of a red tone. But we'll see how it plays out as that uh, H alpha gets blended in. Um, and that's, I don't know, that's, that's kind of it and what I'd like to do. I do like the way my star color came out. I gave Pix Insights a uh, uh, color calibration tool a try and it didn't quite work for me but uh, I have a few other things to try on that so I'll go ahead um, so anyone else in the room that did you guys uh, have a chance to process this I, I did uh, briefly I didn't spend as much time as I wanted to on it <clears throat> one thing I did discover I, I actually just looked at the um, narrowband uh, channels and you know I spent maybe 15 minutes on it total but uh, I noticed that I was headed in the same direction that produces less than spectacular results for me so uh, definitely something in my workflow that needs to change because I mean it's you know all this time you think oh well my data sucks and in actuality, it's that, it, you know, your process or your workflow sucks. <laughs> so definitely, uh, definitely a learning experience. But, you know, I'm getting a little better with noise reduction and, and whatnot. So I'm going to give it another whack s soon. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I'm just looking at this data on my screen. I think you're even looking at the uh, Pix Insight screen. And uh, you just notice a little bit more structure down here. Now, this is RGB data. This isn't H-alpha data. 
Uh, I'm sure that structure is in the H alpha, but I don't know. In the RGB, just gives it. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to say a more natural feel, but uh, I, I feel like it gives it slightly more dimension. Fuller. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we'll see. I took a look at it, Adam. Also, not. Not too, not too long of a poke, but a, but a little bit of a poke if you want to share the screen. There we go. So I also agreed. I really like the dark dust lanes as well. Um, that that was what I tried to highlight as much as possible. Um, kind of like some of this wispy stuff down here, nothing here, nothing here. Um, and then even it seemed, you know, sometimes it's tough to tell when you kind of really push the data as far as you can. But it seemed like some of you know it went all the way out of, I guess, the center of the cave nebula, up into these corners here, and if you kind of really you know uh, stretch that RGB a lot, you can see some of these kind of areas even here too. You got what seemed to me like sort of a little bit of a of a kind of very diffuse bluish reflection. I don't know if any of you guys ran into that at all. Um, but, but that is sort of what I noticed seemed like it was coming up a little bit uh, after balancing everything, uh, you know, kind of over here. But, it, but then you can still see those kind of dust lanes coming through that as well. So that was sort of what I focused on. And then just a couple little kind of tricks. Um, I only used HA with the RGB here. Um, and I blocked out all the stars. Uh, when I added the HA to it, I just did kind of like Eric, a really kind of um, uh, HA tone map that I added to this. And I did that more to bring out, I guess, the HA structure, but did everything I could to block off some of the uh, the, the cool dark stuff that was just in the reflection. Um, and so that the tricks I like to use for that kind of thing are like kind of soft lights and noise reduction on the dark areas, um, soft light layers in Photoshop. And and when I do that, I only reveal the really dark stuff, and that kind of gives it a nice, I guess, uh, kind of more of a natural feel. It doesn't look super grainy, even though it is something that's pretty dark. Um, so yeah, thanks for sharing this data, Eric. It was a lot of fun to work with, and honestly, I mean, I, I think almost like just a little bit of a stretch and a, and a tiny boost on the color seemed like it uh, got it ninety percent of the way there, and then the rest is just kind of fiddling around to get the most out of it and, and, you know, kind of present it in the way you want to present it. But um, it's a very, very cool data set. You could have taken a million different ways. Um, I like the more na natural look too, so I kind of stick, tend to stick more with the uh, HJ as a luminance and maybe bump it into the red just a little bit, but um, I keep away from, from the, I guess, full narrow band images a lot of the time. I see you have a lot more of that blue tone in that dark area above the, the cave. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, again, I, it's, sometimes it's tough to tell what, what's real and, and what's not real when you stretch the stuff a lot, but um, it's, it seemed like it was right. There wasn't a gradient in, in the blue frame at all. Um, uh, you know, I did a couple different versions of color calibration to see what was going on there. So I think maybe there is, there is some, some diffuse reflection stuff going on there. But um, just a really cool set of data to work with. Well, there's some reflection right at the head of the, the cave, right at the interface. Yeah, right where you yeah. have the mouse. Yeah. And there's also right below that, there's that yellowish orange reflection. If you move your mouse down right there, yeah, that's a reflection nebula too. Yeah, it was cool. That, and a lot of good detail in there, and it's a lot of fun to play with. Most of the stars seem to retain their color pretty well, which is cool. You don't always get uh, really good deep data that also has good star color in it. One of the things I like about it is, uh, I don't know, I feel like with good optics, uh, the diffraction spikes just look that much prettier. Um, they get that kind of rainbow uh, prism look coming off of them. Yeah. Uh, and it's just kind of perfectly tight. Um, and that's coming from someone who never really liked diffraction spikes and chose not to buy an RC for the longest time because I didn't like diffraction spikes. But um, 
eventually got used to them. It actually seems more specifically to RGB because uh, you don't really see the, the spikes on, on narrowband. Mm -hmm. another, th another thing you get uh, from if you put a lot of time into like an L data in a really dark site is that the image becomes super smooth and people mistake that by no noise reduction. And sometimes you'll get uh, comments like, oh, you, know, you did too much reduction where you, you may have done none because people are, people are used to that noisy look. And when, they, when people see a smooth image, they, you, they assume that you did too much noise reduction. Mm -hmm. And I, I've actually noticed that first time on one of Josh's images where he did on one of the star parties. And I, the, the, the background was like, perfectly smooth and I but you could tell that it was a noise reduction it was just 40 hours of data that's what it was yeah well I don't know I feel like uh, you should shoot until you feel like you don't need noise reduction you're always going to use a little bit of noise reduction but uh, there's no substitute for just lots and lots of time and uh, lots of subs um, and I don't where an image that has lots of noise reduction, you'll look at and say, oh, it looks very noise reduced. Um, I don't think that uh, when you shoot lots and lots of subs of something, it looks noise reduced. I think it just looks really clean. Um, unless it's out of focus and it's bad data. Unless it's out of focus, right. Um, interesting, we're getting a, a an image posted on uh, in chat, uh, I, are you looking at my screen? Let me make sure you are. Oop, nope. There we go. Um, and now who just submitted this? Zach submitted this. Uh, Zach, that's nice. Yeah. yeah that, that looks very familiar. Um, great job of noise reduction. I like the star color, uh, and I think Zach went the same way with me trying to preserve as much of the foreground as possible, but he probably did a better job uh, getting a lot of that um, nebula in the outside. I don't know whether he uh, did RGB or H-alpha RGB. Um, hard for me to tell from this alone. If he did H-alpha RGB, then basically I'm trying to do exactly what he did. Uh, with my well, next, uh, just judging from what you can see on the screen, which may not be accurate, I don't see some of the fine detail around the edge. Yeah, so that means he probably didn't use the H alpha. It he said HRGB, so well, yeah, the question is, how did you combine it then? Yes, 50 50 blend. <laughs> well, that's a little different way to incorporate, yeah. Okay. See, that's where that's where if you're willing to do a little bit more thinking and, and uh, spend a little bit more time uh, processing the data and combining the H alpha with the R, uh, the H alpha with the red, uh, then I think you can preserve a little bit more of the structure. But it, it comes down to, uh, I think what I had done earlier is uh, you spend a lot of time on an image, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and all of a sudden you say, you know what, it's not worth the time. And uh, or you you do it just as good as you possibly can, and you say that's good enough for me. Uh, but uh, that's me. Um, Actually, Adam, I like processes with less thinking involved. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, I I always say something if um, if there's two ways to do something and they give equal results, then pick the easiest. And. Uh, the, that, those are words to live by because there are a lot of times it'll save you a lot did of time. RGB or did anybody do uh, Joe or anything? I, I missed the last part of that. Did everybody do RGB or did anybody else try a, a Hubble palette or SHO? There, there were a Hubble. There were a few Hubble palettes on uh, the Image of the Week submission page, uh, and I had got, I had shown off I think a few of them. Um, are you still looking at my? You see the Astro Imaging channel? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, kind of a, uh, this is kind of a modified Hubble palette. Or maybe it's a Hubble palette without the, still with a dominant green. 
Yeah, yeah I think it's, all, it's a public palette where you haven't adjusted the histogram, and it looks like it wasn't tone map either because they have the, you know, you can see some of the, the purple halos round from the dominant uh, HA. Yeah, I didn't adjust the histogram of mine either, so that's probably why mine turned out the way it did. Yeah, basically, um, let's see if I could, uh, they kind of kill the green in the elbow palette so that you have what what's green is more of that kind of golden to tone, and then you get just some really cool blues up in here. Um, the other reason that I chose to do RGB is I actually thought there was more interesting stuff in the RGB data than... Uh, in the combined H alpha O3 S2 data, because in the O3 and S2 there wasn't much, and uh, it would have taken tone mapping uh, or star removal to really stretch it that far. Um, so that's just me. Uh, that said, I don't know. Does anyone else have any other questions in regards to the data, or uh, anybody out there in chat have any specific issues they had, or? Hey, Adam, I've been processing it in the background as we've been talking. I'm not quite done with it, but uh, I can show it off in just a couple minutes. Okay, cool. I got a question. Why do they call this thing the cave nebula? Because to me, it looks more like a caveman nebula. <laughs> I don't know. You see the head right there and the arms coming off to the sides and the body? He's kind of hunched over. I guess I can see that. You're like my wife. She walks in on these well-described, well-named images, and she says, "Isn't this a, a a woman walking through the fog?" I go, "Where did that come from?" I think it looks more like the mountain from the Steven Spielberg movie. What was that flick about the UFOs that he did? Devil's Mountain or whatever, Devil's Devil's Tower. You Devil's Tower, to, yeah. You mean Close Encounters? Close Encounters of the yeah, yeah. Third Kind, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Nathan I, Morgan. How are you coming, David? I'm interested um, to see what you yeah, come up with. I'm almost there. Just just a comment on the naming of the cave nebula. I was thinking, well, maybe it was visual, but I remember visually this thing's invisible. It's one of the Caldwell list, and um, it, I, I think it was the last of the northern objects I got just because um, I, you can't see the thing. And I'm using, you know, big dots and stuff like that. So it's very, very difficult to see this thing. So maybe, maybe it's from the uh, the spectral response or the spectral um, sensitivity of whatever plates they used back when they named it, huh? Could be. Could be. Although these, these things get named and renamed more, much more frequently than you might expect. I don't know if you realize that. Like, to try to try to tell kids at an outreach about the uh, ET um, cluster, oh, and yeah. they go, and they go, "Who's ET?" <laughs> so, and it's got about eight different names, just depending on what area you you grew up with it. Yeah, but all that is about visual astronomy, and it's not not for you guys. <laughs> so, Adam, can you see my screen? Let me flip over now. Well, well Alex, astro imaging is visual. It's just delayed yep. visual. It's what? It's delayed visual. Well, it's not the same. It's, <laughs> you know, water skiing and skiing are two different things. Yeah, yeah. two different disciplines for sure. Yeah. David, we can't see your screen. Okay, I, I haven't had a chance to do any noise reduction or any kind of real enhancement on it yet, but this is just the combination of doing the continuum map with the, the blue in combination with HA to try to get uh, a luminance that enhanced the, the reflection nebula uh, when I did a luminance combined. Oh, that looks really good. So, so I, I got an RGB image, David? It, it is kind of. So I, I did blend the, 
the RGB. So I took RGB, did an RGB combination with it. And then I took the SHO data, combined that, and then I blended those a certain amount. Um, more weighted a little more to the SHO, and that one wasn't a straight SHO. It was, uh, you know, 20% HA and 80% S2 for the red, 20% HA and 80% uh, O3 for the green, and then O3 for the blue uh, to get this kind of orangey, slightly greenish blue tint to it. And like that it was, was watermelon. Yeah. And, yeah, and that one was kind of blended a little bit with the RGB, and then I did the continuum map stuff for uh, with the HA to get the, the luminance combined with that. Is uh, the continuum map in uh, pixel math? No. Um, well, yes, I, I had used pixel math, but it's a process using pixel map and noise uh, pixel math and noise reduction uh, con combinations. Did you know, you David, and uh, noise reduced. We're still, we're still trying to stand up on skates and Pix Insight, and you're doing double axles. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, it's it's not a very difficult process. It's really just some multiplication and division. Um, there's a I can't remember who wrote the article now um, out there on on it, but uh, um, it's the same kind of concept. Like there's a continuum filter you, you can get. For example, if you get an HA filter and then a, a C filter, a continuum filter, it's just slightly off the HA uh, band so that you get all the stars with effectively the same intensity so that the stars can be removed and you know you can deal with the nebulosity separately all right it's the same type of idea you're trying to use the structures in the image uh, to do that same kind of pull out the that continuum map and separate the things out a little bit i'm sure so it can be I done know. using you know star removal too right so are you removing the blue from the red? In this case, it's it's a real cheat because the continuum map kind of relies on a red image and an HA image, uh, effectively trying to have the same structures in it because the red image is going to have your HA data in there, right? right. Um, this is a real cheat because you know I'm I'm using the blue and so you know what it's actually doing under the covers. Yeah, it's a little hard to say, but uh, it seems like it did okay, kind of pulling out the, the blues in the reflection nebula over the top. Definitely works. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's preventing that H-alpha from dominating, which is what you have to be able to do. Um, good job, David, in a in, uh, short time while watching a presentation. <laughs> Although he doesn't have to watch our presentations. Um, all right. Well, uh, anyone else in the room, process that have any comments on it uh, or have anything different they want to uh, uh, talk about? I see that Mark has uh, reprocessed his image. Let's give everyone a shot to see this. Uh, this is our image of the week. So... Uh, I'm sorry, it takes me for, oh, you're already looking at it. Uh, yeah, there you go, Mark. Uh, L's reprocessed cave nebula image. Mark's in chat, so uh, feel free to give him a congratulations on this. Uh, nice job. Um, that said, uh, we, uh, I will try and post sometime midweek or whenever I come up with it next week's episode. Um, oh, good, we did get a question. When you image, are you generally taking both RGB and narrow band? Uh, I no. Um, I'm not going to say uh, you do one or the other because a lot of people will try and combine their RGB images with H alpha, uh, or at least H alpha RGB is probably the most typical way you would combine narrow band with RGB imaging. Uh, but uh, for the most part, if you're RGB imaging, you're going to be shooting something like a galaxy. Um, you can shoot nebula RGB, uh, but that's where it gets into that H alpha RGB enhancement really benefiting you. Uh, or if you have a nebula that is rich in O2 or S3, um, or O3 or S2, um, uh, then you can uh, do basically a, a full narrowband blend 
uh, and get a lot of that rich color that you see in kind of the uh, Hubble palette images and um, kind of other palettes that you might use for narrow band. Uh, so uh, not generally, you can. Uh, you can get creative and do any combination of them. Uh, but I think for the most part, people say I'm shooting an RGB or I'm shooting a narrow band. Um, and, and sometimes some people don't like RGB stars in narrow band images. They, they like to leave them white. So they'll leave the, uh, but the, in my case, I, I like RGB stars in narrow band images because I, I map them a little different, but some people just don't like them. Yeah, and, and it really does come down to that. Uh, what does the person who's making the image want to see in it? Uh, do you like the look of RGB stars? Uh, do you think stars should all be white? Um, very recently, that was kind of uh, the, the technique is to uh, make your stars just blow out so that you can't really see any of the color in them. Because uh, they, with narrow band, they would be purple. Uh, well, but I think. It, it yes. wasn't that, I mean, the whole point of having white stars in a Hubble palette image is that star color has no meaning in narrow band imaging. Mm -hmm. so that, and plus, personally, I think that if you mix in the, the normal star color palette with the narrow band uh, Hubble palette, to me, it just, you know, it just, it's like fingers on a, nails on a blackboard. I just don't like the look of it. Plus, the RGB stars are always much, much bigger than nice, tight, narrowband stars, mostly from HA. So I, I put my vote in making your stars white, because that makes the most sense, and I think looks the best, too. Well, I think we'll all uh, have our own um, kind of red line and what we'll cross when it comes to uh, the, the artistic versus the scientific integrity. Um, and it all just comes down to, I think, what we like to see. Because um, I, I think, uh, I, well, I'll agree with what you just said, is a lot of the times RGB stars may not look right in a narrow band image. But at the same time, if you can make the stars look good or in some way enhance the overall look of the image, then I think uh, you might end up with a, a better image out of whatever you're processing. Um, but that's kind of my own opinion. Uh, I, I think that's one of the ways that a lot of the professional images have changed over the past few years is uh, you used to be perfectly satisfied with just making those uh, stars, I'm not going to say disappear, but who cares about stars? Uh, and then at some point it was like, okay, I could care about stars a little bit. And all of a sudden people are trying to make their stars as pretty as possible. Um, not just in regards to color, but um, shrinking them, uh, making sure they, uh, the light fall off is appropriate, not too saturated, um, whatever it may be. Um, okay, so that said, uh, I, I think that's basically it for the day. Adam? Yes. Adam, we need to put a link on the bottom of this video to, for the chat for the Astro Imaging Channel's website because uh, there's a chat going on on YouTube right now and people are asking questions and nobody's paying attention over there. I will, I will put uh, something on the bottom, on the website so that you'll see it there. If you're on YouTube, you're not going to see it, so I'm going to basically have to remind you every time, but uh, we do not watch the YouTube comments, uh, or excuse me, the YouTube chat. We have our own chat on our website, the Astro Imaging Channel, that lets you post pictures. Uh, it lets you do a whole lot more stuff that really benefits us. You can also pop it off, so if you want to watch us on YouTube, you can watch us live on YouTube and pop the chat off. Or you can just watch us on our website where um, you have a few different options. Um, but uh, yeah, our chat costs us a lot of money, but it works really well. So please use it. Um, all right. Well, I hope uh, I hope I didn't get too many questions there. Adam, yes. Ooh, Adam. Hey, can I uh, make a couple of announcements here about some upcoming things? Sure. Um, I'm going to share my screen if you don't mind. Um, the 
couple of things are software BISC. A few years ago, Richard Wright and Steve BISC and Sarah BISC and a few other people came out to GMARS and had a, a workshop. And if anybody's got a Paramount, you probably want to get in on this. It's over at uh, Woodland Hills again, telescopes.net. And uh, you come out there and then come camping with us and stuff like that. Uh, it's in November 12th, I think, or something like that. November 11th, it says. So um, that's something you might be interested in. And I really was was really uh, surprised. We had a couple of people have come up to me lately, both at AIC and in my email, and said that they were going to go to nightfall because um, because of the imaging rigs of nightfall. Um, one fellow asked me if he could set up near that that collection of uh, paramounts and I said well you're welcome to but it's actually I kind of moved around and those paramounts are in various places there will be an imaging workshop Eric Blackhurst of plane wave will be there and um, he's going to be doing some interesting things there's lots of other things on the agenda and that's at nightfallstarparty.com and it sure would be nice to see you I also wanted to say um, since this is my first time back since AIC that those of you who uh, came up to me, and I know Eric got this too, and said, you know, thank you for doing all the stuff you do on, on the Astro Imaging channel. It really was encouraging. I appreciate that, that you appreciate this. Um, you know, we are always looking for good presenters or even presenters presenters, and we always want people to participate. So um, we know it's a big thing, and we know it helps a lot of people, and we'd like to have everybody who would like to help um, come on on come on in and and you know do some help and out and make some presentations and stuff like that okay thank you Adam yes uh, one more thing at AIC I mean, you're right I got a few taps on the shoulder about aren't you one of the guys from the astro imaging channel Tolga. and then one guy tapped me on the shoulder and said are you Tolga <laughs> you hit him didn't you <laughs> I said yes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It depends. Does he owe you any money? <laughs> anyway, um, it was fun. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys, for coming. Yeah, like Alex said, we're always looking for presentations. If you have an idea for one and you think you can present it, uh, contact me. There's a contact form on our website, theastralimagingchannel.com. Um, and, yeah, otherwise, have a good week. Uh, keep an eye open for the presentation uh, for next week's session. And uh, thanks for coming. Good night. Good night.